Okay, I think we are ready to go here. So I would like to welcome everybody to this very exciting Summer of Sabre event. And I'm just gonna pull up a, a screen to share a couple slides real quick before we jump in with our guests. So give me just one sec. I am Jason Schwartz from the Chicago chapter. Some of you may know me as well from the Baseball Cards Research Committee. So uh, let's give me one sec here. I'm sorry, I thought I had this set up. Okay, here we go. So um, I think most of you in the audience know that 50 years ago today, something incredibly significant happened in the baseball world that really continues to have repercussions over many of our lives present day. And that is, of course, Harmon Killebrew hit his 500th home run, becoming the 10th member of the 500 Home Run Club. And that is something that I am here to celebrate with all of you. Okay, just kidding. Actually, it was the founding of Sabre, August 10th, 1971, Cooperstown, New York, the Cooperstown 16. And we have one member of the Cooperstown 16 with us today, along with a cross-section of other Sabre members I have six guests today who represent Sabre members who joined in five different decades. I'm gonna have them introduce themselves. The first thing I'll just indicate as I was doing my research for this panel on Wikipedia, I came across the fact that uh, not quite Sabre, but Sabre is an Arabic word, which means of all things, persistence and perseverance. And here Sabre is 50 years later after its founding, still around, I would say, not only surviving, but thriving. And so there was certainly uh, a little bit of coincidence there that I think this has been a group that has persisted and persevered. And what we'll focus on today is how we got here, potentially where we've been and even where we're going. So with that in order of when they joined, I'm going to have our guests introduce themselves. And so, Tom Hufford, I believe you were there at the very beginning as a 16 year old. Uh, go ahead and let us know uh, your chapter or chapters you're affiliated with, uh, some of your primary interests, and then I'm certainly gonna have a lot more to ask you later in the show. Thanks, guys. Tom Hufford, I'm Sabre member number six. Actually, I was 21. Uh, founding meeting. Dan Ginsburg was the youngest person there. And he was either 15 or 16. I think. Uh, one thing I can say without fear of contradiction, probably, is I'm the only person on this Zoom meeting tonight who knows exactly where they were and what they did 50 years ago today. Uh, if anyone else does, raise your hand and <laughs> we'll talk later. Uh, I grew up in Pulaski, Virginia, uh, later lived in Washington, D.C., and Atlanta, Georgia. Now I split time between Atlanta and Euro Beach, Florida, where I am now. My interests are in all things baseball, especially biographical research. Uh, I've been on the board of Sabre, let's see, was secretary in 1976 and served on the board of directors from 2006 to 2013. Uh, Jason, I want to thank you for hosting this uh, get together tonight and to sure look forward to the next hour. Fantastic. So in order of joining a member from our very first year, 1971, though not a founder, I will introduce Pete Palmer as the man who pretty much made me stop studying in college because I discovered the wonderful book that he wrote with John Thorne, Total Baseball. I became obsessed with the book, stopped going to class, and just studied Total Baseball for probably the last year and a half of college. So welcome, Pete. Uh, let us know your chapter affiliation, some of your special interests, and I'll certainly have more questions for you later on as well. Oh, I'm sorry, am I on? 
You are on, Pete. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, gee, you know, uh, I had written Bob Davids a letter because uh, he used to get a lot of little articles in the sporting news, and uh, they decided to cancel that uh, idea. And I was always told that, that was one of the reasons why he decided to uh, develop Saber. Uh, so we can thank the sporting news for that. But at any rate, I should have been at the meeting, but uh, I, I was number 27. I didn't realize how close Cooperstown was to my home in Massachusetts. And so I decided not to go, but uh, you know, uh, I was doing a lot of stuff on my own, figuring stats and stuff, and I really had no outlet for it. And uh, I did a, I edited a few uh, editions of the old uh, Turk and Thompson Encyclopedia, but aside from that, I really didn't have much outlet. Uh, I had contact with the Sporting News with Paul McFarlane and I, I wrote a kind of a technical article on analysis and they were gonna publish it in 1969, but they chickened out at the last minute because they thought it was too complicated so I had to wait till I met John Thorne in 1980 through Sabre to get Total Baseball going. And thanks, Tom, for your comments. But uh, so without Sabre, I'd probably be still sitting at my desk fooling around with stuff. And, and uh, of course, uh, Bill James really developed the market to show there was a market for analysis. And uh, without Bill's work, and John's uh, writing ability and knowledge of the publishing industry, I don't know if we'd ever been able to do the book. And uh, so, uh, and then after that, uh, my friend Gary Gillette and I kind of got together and we've been working on the various uh, statistical data sources for uh, the last 20 years or so with stats and ESPN and uh, baseball reference and I'm still doing that now and I'm happy to uh, have found uh, uh, this because without Saber, I don't think I ever would have gotten to the point where I am giving me an outlet for all my stuff. Well, it's, it's wonderful then that you found Saber and that Saber found you. Let me go next to a guest where uh, like much in baseball research, there's some controversy as to the exact date I have Tom Schieber as having joined Sabre in 1982, but he let me know he's not quite sure that's accurate. I trust him more than I trust me. But Tom, give us a rough idea when you think you joined uh, your chapter affiliations and some of your main interests. Sure. So um, actually, I think that this mystery has been solved. I, I joined in 1981, but I believe that it goes on the books at 82 because uh, I think Cliff Cackline, who was um, sort of running things at that time, he would not process on a daily basis. I mean, it was a lot more ad hoc. And so I think it didn't get processed until like the next year. So I joined in 81, but according to the record books, it's 82 and I'll just go with the record books. That's fine. There's a little asterisk next to that. I, I think because we knew that you were going to be a superstar, we went with a little bit of service <laughs> time manipulation, right? <laughs> we wanted to keep, you, keep you low paid for as long Thank as you. we could. So, Kept me uh, in the minors for a long time. Okay. So uh, I, Yes, so uh, I'm Tom Schieber. I, uh, uh, what chapters have I been involved with? Um, I lived in LA for a dozen years, so I was part of the Alan Roth chapter down in Southern California. And then when I moved to Cooperstown, I joined the Cliff Cackline chapter, uh, which I'm currently a member. Um, and uh, interests, my interests are varied, I guess, but uh, I'm pretty interested in uh, images, baseball images. Uh, I like uh, dead ball era and 19th century, so um, those earlier days. Um, evolution of rules is, an, is a long time uh, interest of mine. Um, and uh, seeing baseball in places that you wouldn't normally think you would see baseball, um, that's also kind of an interest, so. Fantastic, well, thanks, thanks for being with us. I'll come back to you with more questions soon enough. Let's now proceed to the 1990s, if I have the date right, I think 1998, Anthony Salazar joined Saber. So Anthony, let us know your chapter affiliations and some interests, and I'll have more questions soon.
Sure, absolutely. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Anthony Salazar, and I joined Sabre. Um, you know, the records say 1998, but I swear it might have been just a tad earlier as well. Um, yeah, I one day uh, saw so you know, my background's in history, American social and urban history, and I've been a baseball fan all my life. And, and I feel like at the time I was just struggling to sort of try to find uh, ways to merge those interests. And I was reading, I had a subscription to uh, Baseball Weekly at the time. It was uh, an old um, publication of USA Today. And I remember getting to the back page and seeing this little itty bitty ad that said something like, interested in baseball? Yeah. Interested in baseball research? Yeah. Like, join Sabre. I'm like, ooh, what's Sabre? So I'm like looking a little harder, a little fine print there. I'm like, Society for American Baseball Research. And I thought, oh, hey, that sounds like a great organization. So I sent in my 20 bucks or whatever it was and, uh, and became a member. And I was just really thrilled to find like-minded people uh, who, you know, again, shared similar interests. So I'm, um, my, I'm, the, I'm in the Pacific Northwest chapter uh, living in Seattle. And I've got interest in Latino baseball and baseball arts, as well as, thank you, Jason, baseball cards. Uh, so those are the main, and a few others, of course, but those are the main ones that I feel the most affinity to. So it's just been great to be a part of this organization. I'll look forward to the rest of the panel. So thank you. Uh, fantastic. Well, welcome, Anthony. Uh, next, I believe the date is 2008. I think once the internet registration and signups <laughs> got going, it was a little quicker on the turnaround time. Emily Hawks. Emily, tell us about your chapters and your interests and welcome sure. to the panel. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, so I'm Emily. Um, I'm same as Anthony. I'm part of the Northwest chapter, which has a pretty big footprint, but I also happen to be in Seattle. Um, and yeah, I trust you that I joined in 2008 or trust the internet. I don't remember myself, but that sounds right. Um, in terms of, of baseball interest, I think I, I like a little bit of everything. And I think that's kind of what's appealed to me about Sabre is that it's kind of like a baseball smorgasbord. You can kind of take a little bit of everything and learn a little bit about everything. Um, but I think I kind of gravitate towards things that that really make the game quirky, whether it's kind of weird ballpark features or eccentric characters of the game or just really any stories that, um, you know, baseball kind of has a unique way of, of surfacing. I think that's kind of my favorite aspect of the game. Awesome. Okay. Welcome, Emily. And then last, but certainly not least, uh, I would like to congratulate Donna Muscarella, who has completed, let me check my notes, zero years of membership because she just joined this year. Rookie of the year, Donna Muscarella. Let us know who you are, where you're from, and some of your interests. Hi, I'm from Northern New Jersey. And my chapter is the Elysian Fields chapter. Uh, baseball interests. I've been a baseball enthusiast for as long as I can remember. My earliest memory is at two and a half. You may think I'm joking, but I'm dead serious. First baseball game, Yankee Stadium. Um, baseball interests, uh, baseball photography, baseball cards, Negro Leagues, stadiums, minor league baseball. We'll stop there. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we could, we could go on. We could go on. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Awesome. So uh, I'm feeling good because I think we have assembled a panel then of folks who've joined Sabre at very different times. Uh, definitely check off the range of interest. Donna's almost done that by herself. I connected to something that Anthony said. It's funny, before I joined Sabre, I was known among my friends as the guy who knows everything about baseball. Well, once I joined Sabre and I made Sabre friends, now I'm known as the guy who knows hardly anything about baseball. Uh, so anyways, there's that. I, I think that's okay. Um, so Tom Hufford, I'm going to come back to you. One of the Cooperstown 16, I've really got two questions. Number one, how did you all find each other? I'm guessing you weren't just all at the hall of fame same day and said, let's start a club, right? So how did you find each other? And initially in founding the organization, what were you hoping to accomplish? Okay. I've made some notes here because otherwise I could talk on this for several hours, uh, I think we all met uh, and got together through Tip, Cliff Kaplan, who was the historian of the Hall of Fame at that time. Uh, actually, I got a letter from Bob Davids, like the other uh, 15 founders did, uh, along with you know, a handful of other people. And the best we can put together is uh, 
Bob had this idea about putting a, a research organization together. He called them a group of status historians. And uh, I had corresponded with other uh, of these 16 uh, that were interested in biographical research. We had met through, through Cliff. And uh, looking back, I think most everyone that was there had uh, a history of correspondence with Cliff uh, because he worked at the Hall of Fame. If we had, you know, any any research questions or anything, we had it solved, no problem, or whatever. We would write a letter to Cliff, and uh, so Cliff knew uh, people all over the country that uh, would correspond with the Hall of Fame and that he would meet in his travels. And evidently, when Bob had the idea of putting a group together, he asked Cliff, could you send me a list of some people that you correspond with on a regular basis and uh, that you think might be interested in such a thing. So um, in my case, I got a letter out of the blue from Bob. I knew who he was from, uh, like Pete said, reading some of Bob's articles that page of sporting news uh, when I was growing up. Bob did historical uh, articles, uh, you know, usually tying them in something that had just recently happened in the major leagues. And um, the Sporting News was cutting back on those kind of things. And Bob thought, gee, there's some other people out there I know that must be doing the same thing. Maybe we should all meet each other. <laughs> so letters went out to, I don't know how many people. Uh, and when, when I got the letter, uh, I was interested, uh, I had no idea, you know, or ever had, had joining or forming an organization like this. I was just excited because this meeting was going to be held in Cooperstown at the same time as the Hall of Fame induction ceremony that year. I'd never been to Cooperstown. Uh, oh boy, that'd be fun to go to. And I called Bob. Uh, he said, if, if you can get to Washington, D.C., I was living in Southwest Virginia at the time. He said, yeah, you can ride up to the family with my wife and daughter and myself. So uh, I found the Greyhound bus ran to New York City, not to New York, but uh, to Washington. Went up there. We did make the trip together. Uh, the organizational meeting was, was held the day after the induction ceremony. It was a busy time looking back at the calendar. Uh, we would have gotten there uh, on Sunday. Uh, the induction ceremony was Monday morning. The exhibition game between the Cubs and the uh, Indians was that afternoon. Then we met us at the Hall of Fame Library the next day and started putting this organization together. Uh, I was 21. I looked around, thought it was kind of my Forrest Gump moment. <laughs> Uh, you know, I had no idea what I was being a part of at that time. All I knew was, other than Dan Ginsburg, who was younger than I, all these looked like such old men that knew everything. So Jason, like you said, uh, you know, growing up in school, you were the, the guy that knew everything, and then you show up to this group and, and you know nothing. Uh, looking back now, I figured out 
Uh, Tom Shea was the oldest of the founders, and at that meeting he was 67, uh, which means right now I'm older than everyone else at that meeting was. So I wonder how many people look at me now and say, oh, there's old guys. But I'll take it. I'll try to go through this pretty quick. What to achieve at, at this meeting? Um, it's pretty much what we wanted to see is pretty much summed up in the five objectives that we decided on by the end of the day. Uh, first one was to foster the study of baseball as a significant American social and athletic institution. The second, to establish an accurate baseball through the years. Next, to facilitate the dissemination of search information. Then to stimulate the best interests of baseball as our national pastime. And finally, to cooperate in safeguarding the proprietary of individual research efforts as members of the society. Uh, looking back, I think we did a pretty good, uh, good job of, of putting those goals and objectives together. And most of what Saber's done over the years, I think, you know, stick to those pretty well. We agreed of, on annual dues of $10. We tried to establish a constitution, wanted to have an annual meeting. Uh, publish a newsletter letter that became the Sabre Bulletin and an annual, public, or, uh, an annual publication, which turned out to be the Baseball Research Journal. We decided on four research committees at that uh, initial meeting. The Biographical Research Committee, Negro League Committee, Publications Committee, and a Minor League Committee. Who basically covered the interests of those who were <laughs> those who were at the meeting. But you know, looking back, uh, I think we were pretty early on, and I'm I'm proud that one of the uh, first Negro committee uh, the day before we met, uh, Patrick Page was inducted into the Hall of Fame, and the first. Uh, person selected uh, after the Hall of Fame had, had decided to honor some of the players. Uh, how many members would we be able to get? Well, again, we thought Cliff would have an idea of how many people around the country there were that would be interested. And he estimated there were probably 50 people. Well, after we met, there was a little article the next week in the Sporting News saying this group had been formed. Uh, here's how to join if you're interested. Uh, we reached member number 50 on September 28th. So it took about six weeks for us to reach all the people in the country that Cliff thought we would be able to get. Uh, when 1971 ended, we had 78 members. And on our first anniversary, we had 112. Obviously, I'm the only surviving member of that organizational meeting 50 years ago today. And I'm sorry that the other 15 are not here with us. Uh, I do want to take a moment, because I know if I don't do it now, we won't have time and I'll forget it. And I do want to recognize the other 11 current SABRE members who also joined in 1971 that are still active members today. Number 19 was Bill Plot from Montgomery, Alabama. I joined on August 26th. And some of you that watched the proceedings from the Malloy Conference a couple of weeks ago saw a interesting presentation on the Birmingham Black Baron. 
Number 27 on September 1st with Pete Palmer, who you're going to hear more from uh, here with us. Number 36 with Ken Holt from Bloomington, Illinois. 42 was Carl Klein from, I think, AIEA, Hawaii, going on September 17th. 44 was Gary Jackson from Lockport, Illinois. 46 is Tom Zocco from Weathersfield, Connecticut. Tom uh, hasn't missed any national convention. It's probably like 43. I don't know. 48 was Eric Simonson uh, from Newton, Massachusetts. 53, Joel Busser, Champaign, Illinois. 55, George Goodman, Winnipeg, Canada. Joel and George uh, joined the same day, October 1st. 57 was John Hallway from Manassas, Virginia. Number 74 was David Neff from New York City. David was well known for his work on the Hill and Encyclopedia in 1969. So we still have 12 active members who joined in 1971. Uh, going a little further out to our anniversary uh, in August 72, we still have two active members that joined after that with Harvey Forrest in Bronx, New York. And number 88 was uh, Dick Kramer from Moreland, Pennsylvania. Uh, it's been an honor for me to have been on the team with these members for the past 50 years and to work with our officers and board members and the staff to help make Sabre the organization it is today. I want to salute all who have worked so hard to put this Sabre 50 celebration together this year, too. And I hope you'll find be borrowing one of his lines to each and every one of you, uh, our current members and uh, all the people who've been members in the past. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for making this day necessary. Oh, that's, that's wonderful, Tom. That's wonderful, Tom. So let me move things over to Pete Palmer. <laughs> Pete? Your name was invoked. You have 30 seconds. No, I'm teasing. That's presidential debate uh, moderation rules. Uh, Pete, you were number 27. You joined just three weeks or so after the organization was founded. It sounded like, was it a postcard? Was it something in the sporting news? Uh, when you joined, what did you think you were joining? Uh, what interested you and what made you say, yes, this is for me? Well, as I said, I just happened to have written Bob Davids in July, commenting on the fact that his uh, he seemed to have been terminated at the Sporting News from supplying little tidbits here and there. And so he mentioned that he was thinking of starting this new organization. And he sent me a copy of the original invitation. But as I said, I, I should have gone, but I, I just thought it was too far or something. I, I'm not really sure why, but uh, so I was aware of it at the time. Uh, and I, I, I signed up as soon as I could, I guess. Uh, so I got it directly from the horse's mouth. Yeah, yeah, so you, you were like recruited pretty much. I, I don't think I was recruited. I, I think I just had to fill out a form, but uh, let me let me ask you, Tom. Uh, I think I first heard of Saber maybe in 1985 or 1984. I think in a, a Bill James baseball abstract. For you, if you joined in 1981 or 82, I think it might have been even before those were out. Uh, how was it that Saber came across your radar? What did you think it was? And when you joined, was it about what you thought, or were there some surprises? Um. It was what I thought it was, uh, um, uh, hoping it would be. Um, I was uh, interning at the Sporting News in St. Louis at the time, and, um, and Pete mentioned uh, Paul McFarland's name. Paul McFarland uh, was uh, 
a longtime guy at the Sporting News. Uh, he sort of ran the archives, although he's not really an archivist. And uh, so I worked with him um, and a couple of the guys there. And Paul knew that I was interested in baseball research. And he said, well, you should, you should uh, take a look at Sabre, which I didn't know anything about. So I did, and it sounded good. So I joined. And um, I had been doing baseball research since I was, a, you know, like 12 or 13 years old. And uh, so at, at that point, um, I didn't know that there was other people that were interested in this kind of thing. So I, uh, I joined and I was very happy with, uh, you know, consuming the publications, basically. It wasn't until um, I got out of college that I really um, started being a little bit more active and interactive, I guess, in the Alan Roth chapter. Um, and um, that was the early 90s, and then going, starting to go to conventions in the early 90s. Okay. So, Anthony, uh, your, your date is disputed, 1998, 1997, one of those. Uh, by then, right, Sabre was, if I'm doing the math right, mm -hmm. almost 30 years old almost 30 years old, sure. uh, we'll say 20, 27, 26 years old, depending. Uh, when you joined, how did you hear of Sabre? What did you think it was? And when you joined, was it about right or was it a little different? I, I, think, it, I think it was about right. You know, um, you know, sort of the truth in advertising and going back to the little, little ad I saw, do I love baseball? Yes. Do I yeah. love research? Yes. And, you know, as many of the folks here have stated, you know, once you come to a Sabre meeting and you meet these other folks and you think, oh, my God, I don't know a damn thing. And I felt so, you know, kind of inferior. I sort of felt myself kind of shrinking in the corner going to my first meeting. And, you know, my first meeting was at a, at a U uh, University of Washington Huskies uh, baseball game. And I remember exactly where we were and what we were doing and who the president was and looking around thinking, wow. And I remember thinking, oh, these guys are old too. Holy crap. And, you know, I was not that I was a spring chicken or anything, but, <clears throat> but I uh, remember thinking, I don't feel like I have enough experience here because these guys know so much more, but I just kind of, you know, uh, kind of sat there and just listened quite a bit and thought, okay, well, I need to say something kind of intelligent. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a Latino baseball historian. So I was able to contribute to, you know, that, uh, that aspect as well, you know, talking about, you know, Fernando, uh, Fernando Mania at the time, which wasn't that old at that period. This was like 1998, 1997. Like I said, I'm sort of, my memory goes, uh, but, you know, Fernando Mania was 1981. So we're, we weren't that far removed for that. So I was able to talk with confidence about that, especially having read uh, Sam Regalado's uh, Viva Baseball. So that was still kind of fresh in my mind because that recently came out. And so I was able to contribute to that. So I felt like, okay, you know, I'm, I, you know, I could be somebody here. You know, I may not be able to talk about stats, which I never ever do, uh, but I can, you know, tell a story about the Latinos and what it was like from a Latino perspective, and you know, feel like I was a part of something. So, and little by little, you know, I started just gaining a little bit more traction and finding my own. And, you know, my dad once told me, look, just, you don't have to be good at everything. Just be good at one thing and be, you know, focused on that. So I wanted to be good at Latino baseball history. And so I studied and studied even more and, you know, uh, assembled a little bit, a pretty, pretty decent library of Latino related history books and was able to find a niche there. And even going to the conference, uh, the convention in Boston the next year, um, I was able to put together a Latino baseball panel, which featured Luis Tiant amongst a room of 500 people. And that was just amazing. And so I felt like, okay, I found it. I found my niche. And, you know, there I was able to meet, you know, a bunch of guys like Eduardo uh, Valero, Edwin Fernandez, Pete Bjarkman, you know, God rest their souls. Uh, and, and sit at the, you know, sit at the table, you know, and have something to say. So, you know, that was something that I felt like, I could contribute something, you know, contribute my knowledge, contribute something that I love to an organization that was a little short in, in that particular area. Um, and I can come back to that later on, but I, I think that Sabre was as billed as advertised. So I really jumped on that quite a bit. Right. And Anthony, do I have it right? Are you the chair today of the Latino Baseball Committee? Yeah. So I've been the chair of the Latino Baseball Committee for some years now. Um, 
And that's just been a joy to just, again, be a part of that. And what's been cool is just be able to, um, you know, it's such a nuanced, you know, a nuanced field because, you know, with, with Latino baseball history, you know, there's, again, it's so nuanced. There's, you can, you can um, cross section it with minor league baseball, with biographies, with baseball cards and Negro leagues and so forth. So to me, it's a very uh, intersectional kind of um, committee. And, you know, the nexus is that love of knowledge amongst these various facets of baseball history. Awesome. So Emily, let me come to you. I believe if my math is correct, that Sabre was about 37 years old <laughs> when you joined. What was your perception before you joined? What was the hook for well, you? you know, and, yeah. I think I might be a, a, one of the uh, first misled generations about Sabre because <laughs> I <laughs> found out about it after Moneyball had come out. So I think, you know, uh, so I joined Sabre in 2008. I, so Moneyball had come out, I think, in 2003. And that was around when I was just starting college. And so that was probably my initial association. Um, and I, I think that it was... Um, I was set straight by the, by the Northwest chapter after, after I actually attended those meetings. But um, yeah, so I, um, I guess I first got involved when this was after I had graduated and I went to like a Mariners fan fest and Sabre had a booth set up there. And our then chapter president, Tim Herlick was, was manning the booth. And I, I walked up and started talking to him probably because I associated it with money ball and that's what I thought it was all about. And, you know, I was a math major and all that, but um, so I got to talking with Tim and he said, well, why don't you come check out one of our, our chapter meetings? So I decided to, to show up and it was at a, a library in Seattle and, um, you know, came to find out that it was a lot more than just uh, stat heads and uh, but that's really what kind of got me hooked I really enjoyed all the historical research that all the chapter members had done and then it was really kind of like sort of a gateway drug you know eventually I was going to the conventions and then it just kind of escalated from there but but yeah I have to confess I think I was I was probably misled <laughs> thanks to thanks to that book right yeah it, I think I might be part of that same misled generation because <laughs> I think if the ad had said do you like baseball I'd say yes definitely do you love research? I might have said, oh, uh, maybe not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> maybe not right? do, you, do you love lunch with a bunch of people talking about baseball? Yeah, exactly. I can do that. But, um, okay, fantastic. And so Donna, 2021, Sabre was almost 50 years old when you joined. We were 49 and a half or so. Um, I think I know your origin story a little, but I don't know if the audience does as much. So for you, uh, what did you think Sabre was? circa 2021 when you made the pivotal consequential decision in your life to become a member? Well, by 2021, I had moved away from the concept of it's a bunch of stat heads. That was my initial perception of Sabre thanks to um, the Bill James baseball abstract that was gifted to me in 1998. Um, but then through my association with the Yogi Berra Museum in 2006 or so, um, I got to take a peek into, I think what were maybe Sabre Day events, but I'm not absolutely positive. I was like, hey, wait a minute. This is just a bunch of people who love baseball who just sit around and talk about baseball and not just crunch numbers. So I was like, this is kind of cool. So I'm embarrassed to say that it took me this long to sign up having known that. But I finally got here. So here I am. Hey, definitely better late than never. Definitely better <laughs> late than never. Um, so <laughs> let me come back to um, the five founding principles that Tom Hufford shared with us. Because as I look at Sabre, and mind you, I've only been here since 2019. I'm not quite the, the historian, right? But it feels to me like in some ways what I see from Saber are so many things that feel kind of new, right? So many things that feel kind of new and different and exciting. But when Tom read those founding principles, they all really seem well aligned to the founding principles, just sort of those principles really growing and being nurtured by members, taking them in different directions, maybe uh, bringing some new perspectives into the mix. So that was um, Tom, I want to say thank you to you for, for reading those, uh, not only for my knowledge, but I think for other uh, attendees we have. Um, so uh, speaking of changes in Sabre, and I'm going to go back to our, our two most senior members of the organization, 50 years and 49.9. I'll start with Tom Hufford. Tom, since that day of founding, other than membership, obviously, growing uh, by leaps and bounds, 
Um, what are some changes you've seen where you say, you know, I didn't really expect that, and I think that's really awesome? I think we may have you on mute at the moment. Um, I can't use my superpowers as co-host to ask to unmute. Okay, Tom, we have you okay. back. So I'll repeat the question. Uh, any changes or surprises over the last 50 years that you didn't expect, but you think are really healthy for the organization? Well, I don't know how I got muted. I must have, uh, it I hate uh, laptops. I probably put my hand down in the wrong place or something. Okay. Uh, but anyway, uh, I mean, Sabre certainly got a lot bigger and they, they, uh, they have a lot more than four uh, committees probably more like 40, I think, is it? Yeah. Uh, but uh, I mean, the basic things have stayed pretty much the same, the historic work and uh, uh, like the biographical work and uh, the statistics or the statistical analysis part has uh, grown and uh, as it has in the actual game of baseball but uh, I think the attitudes and stuff are, haven't really changed that much. It's just, uh, it's certainly bigger, but uh, I think there's, uh, you know, a lot of camaraderie and uh, people finding people that are interested in the same thing they are, and uh, that's kind of timeless. Yeah, fantastic. Tom Hufford, how about you? A pleasant surprise over the last 50 years. Well. So many people that you run into now, if they have heard of Sabre, they'll say, oh, Sabre Metrics. I know, I know that group. It's all the statistics. I will tell you that at that first meeting, there was not a single person there who had a portable computer on their desk at home. Uh, most had never touched a computer. That was 1971, 15 one year ago. I was in college and I know if you went over to the computer building, they had this huge machine that you just punch cards with. But I'm not, I think as far as the statistical analysis part that we're so famous for now, I think that came about because of the ideas that folks like Pete and Bill James uh, and uh, Dick Kramer had, they had the ideas of how to think about baseball in certain terms, but until the computer came along and everyone had one, you really couldn't do much with those ideas. I think the computer revolution changed a lot of how Saber worked. I know it's, it's a lot easier to do biographical research with the help of computers and being able to search the internet than it was 50 years ago when you had to go to libraries and try to find my uh, I still look back at, at what the big changes in Saber have been. I don't. It, it's hard it's hard for me to say anything other than I think starting Saber with the ideas we've had basically formed a group uh, that gave a framework or you know a community where like-minded people can come together. And, and work like Pete was saying, he was sitting and doing work years ago and thought there must be some other people out there doing that, but he didn't know who they were or how to connect. This group uh, formed and, and provided that framework 
uh, in the community could happen. I, I think great idea. Absolutely. Tip of the cap, by the way, to anyone who did baseball research before the internet. I, I can't even I can't even imagine the uh, the degree of difficulty uh, how that was increased. Tom Sheever, let me go to you. You have been a member for almost forty years, which I think would mean you joined when you were maybe negative ten years old. Just guessing from from your looks there. But uh, what what's a pleasant surprise for you? The organization was a little over ten years old, or maybe. 10, depending uh, how we settle that disputed join date. Uh, but what's a pleasant surprise over the last 40 years? I guess that I didn't age. I mean, <laughs> no, I appreciate the compliment. Um, I guess there, there I, I don't know if there's really a, uh, I guess the biggest pleasant surprise was the, um, uh, how welcoming people were. Um, um, when I, um, started going to meetings at the LA local chapter because I was doing my own thing for a while, but finally went to, to meetings. Um, I didn't even know there were meetings until some, somehow I found out there was a local chapter. Um, guys like Dick Beveridge and Annie McHugh, who were uh, head of that uh, chapter for a long time, uh, um, I walked in the room. I'm, I was pretty shy, and uh, they went out of their way to welcome me. And um, that has been something I've noticed for, um, well, I guess literally decades um, in Sabre is how welcoming people have been uh, in the vast majority. And um, that's one thing I really like about Sabre is that, um, you know, it promotes baseball research. It, it uh, provides an outlet for baseball research, but it also really fosters relationships with like-minded folks and, um, and it's done in a friendly way. So. Uh, I guess I, I wish it wasn't a pleasant surprise, but I, I live in the real world and um, uh, it, it is. So that was great. Oh, that's, that's fantastic. Tom, thank you for that. Anthony, how about you? Something, something you've seen as a change in the organization that you didn't expect, but you're, you're proud of. Uh, well, let's see. I just wanted uh, just to get back to what I, you know, kind of the pleasantly surprised things. And, you know, so three things kind of come up, to, uh, come to mind here. I'm just actually just writing them down. And number one was um, the willingness to try things. You know, hey, let's try this. Let's see if it works. And so an example are, is, um, uh, I don't know if you ever, if anybody's recall these, there were these little trivia cards. Uh, they were they were like a set of three. One, they were might've been blue, red and green or something like that. And we gave them away at fan fests. And so that really inspired a really good conversation uh, about you know baseball and baseball research and you know and folks would gather around our fan fest and so they'd start talking amongst each other and I thought that was really cool and 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 the ability to even help other members create these fan fests and so we had a number of fan fests throughout the nation um, and I can speak from experience being at that table uh, at, 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 uh, at Safeco Field, now T-Mobile Park, you know, talking with people about their interests about baseball and so forth. And another thing was, um, you know, when I was on the board for a couple of years, I remember, distinctly remember being in this conference room at a hotel in Phoenix, uh, or it might've been Tempe, someplace like that. And we were, we were sitting in a room and we were thinking about, you know, how could we grow this organization? And it, I've, I, to the best of my memory, and I'm going to say it, FX Flynn was the one who said, what about Sabre Day in America? And I remember that because I was at the whiteboard writing, writing ideas down. And I remember looking at him thinking, that is a terrific idea. And we, we tried it. And Sabre Day in America was born that day, that idea was born. And it has flourished for quite a number of years. And I just like, hey, thumbs up to this organization for willing to try something to increase membership, to increase this opportunity for folks to get really excited about this organization once a year. So I really appreciated the consistency and the perseverance uh, that the organization has showed. So that's been a really pleasant surprise. Awesome. Emily, I'm gonna go to you. I'm also checking the clock, so I wanna make sure uh, we, we leave a little time in case we have a couple audience questions as well. But Emily, 
uh, just over, I guess, or right around 13 years, but that included ascension to the board of directors, among other things. So you've seen a lot, you've done a lot. What was something in the last 13 years where you said, hey, look at that, that's awesome. I didn't expect that to happen at Sabre. Yeah, I, I was thinking about this. I, I think it's maybe in my time in Sabre, it's really been more of a change in perception from the outside of the organization. So I've seen Sabre become just kind of more of a visible player in the baseball industry and just kind of having more of an elevated profile. Um, I think, you know, one clear example that stands out in my mind has been, um, you know, the analytics conference. That wasn't a thing when I first joined and, um, you know, having attended that event multiple times and seeing all the enthusiasm of all the, you know, the young college and grad students that joined, then also just seeing the cases where um, Sabre really kind of surfaced a path for them to work in the game. And and um, I think just things like that have been pretty exciting to see. Awesome. So Donna, I think I'm going to throw you a curveball, if that's OK. okay. Let, sure. me, let, me, uh, let me find my sticky stuff real quick. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so your curveball is this, because I want to turn things to the audience in just a sec. I am going to actually have you not talk about what changes you've seen in your I seven know. or eight months uh, as a member. Uh, but what do you think? Sabre might be 20 years from now that it isn't today. Let's hope we're still around. I think we will be. I I'll, still, will I'll be. still be in memory. Uh, what do you think? Sabre in 20 years, give me something new and different. Well, I think one of the things that I'll use this kind of as the surprise and then the future. Um, one of the things that surprised me about Sabre that I would love to see be a much more prominent part of the organization in 20 years is opportunity for volunteerism. I learned about the baseball reminiscence program since joining Sabre. And it's just, it, it just spoke to my heart and just an opportunity to bring to non-Sabre members the love of baseball. And in this particular case, with uh, people who are in memory care facilities or VA hospitals. So I would love to see a lot of different opportunities for volunteerism, you know, maybe directed towards the youth and getting them interested in baseball, which addresses a different issue that baseball is faced with right now. So that's something that I would really love to see more volunteerism, more outreach to non Sabre members to just spread the love of baseball. Oh, great answer. Great answer. So let me do this audience. Uh, so obviously, thank you for being here. I probably should have said that at the very beginning. But here's your chance. We have an all star crew here of six Sabre members who've all joined at different times. And uh, I'm also seeing Howard Bryant is in the house. So awesome, stay tuned for that in just five minutes. Is there anybody in the audience who would like to ask a question? I've been monitoring the chat. And by the way, panelists, I've been seeing a lot of compliments uh, for you, uh, for Sabre, for what the organization does and everything like that. So uh, any questions coming from the audience? And go ahead and just type directly in the chat, I will. Uh, keep that line open. Okay, and while, while we're waiting on that, we may have answered everything. Sometimes we do that. I know there are people in the audience that are thinking, hey, I'd really love to get in touch with person X after this panel, send them a note. I will say this, by the way, one of my pleasant surprises for Sabre is I've been able to write to all these people in the organization, people who written awesome books and things like that, who in the old days I never thought would write back to me. It turns out almost everybody has. Tom Hufford's a little tough. He's got a little spam filter you got to fight through. Um, but uh, so let's see, there is a question from Steve Treater for Pete Palmer. Pete, how did you come to edit the S.C. Thompson book? Well, I had the original copy in 1950 and uh, I used to write them letters every once in a while, listening to mistakes in the encyclopedia. And uh, when um, it turns out there was another book that S.C. Thompson did called All Time Rosters of Baseball Teams, which I had never heard of. But it turns out it was actually the baseball encyclopedia sorted by year and team. So if you wanted to look up the lineup for the 19. Uh, 20 Yankees, you wouldn't have to go through the whole encyclopedia. You could just go to the 1920 Yankee page and they'd list the whole roster of the team. So that book hadn't been updated for a while. And 
So uh, Julian Yoslav gave me the job of updating that book. And then uh, as a result of that, uh, they gave me the job of doing the encyclopedia. And I think I did about five, four or five editions. I'm not sure exactly how many, but uh, they kind of got blown out of the water by the Macmillan. But it was it gave me a start and I was happy to do it. And uh, it kind of started me on developing a baseball database because I needed a database to update the encyclopedia. But I actually went down to Connecticut and met S.C. Thompson's widow and Rose Thompson, and she gave me some material that he had when he was doing the book, and that was a good start, and uh, I was happy to do that, and as I said, until Sabre came along, I really didn't have much outlet for the, the stuff that I was working on. Yeah, okay, good, good answer. I, uh, I'm seeing a few other questions that I think we may not quite have time for across the whole panel, like for everybody to let us know your favorite players, although feel free to answer that in the chat. Um, and things like favorite saber memory, I had on my list, but I uh, think in the interest of time, I may have you get in touch with our individual members. Uh, let me just take one last look in the chat and... Yeah, okay. Uh, Tom, Tom Sheever, question for you. Could you, uh, this is from Dixie. Could you feel the stardom when you met with future members, Andy McHugh and Dick Brevage in LA? My follow-up question would be, could they feel the stardom? But okay. Uh, no, I thought everybody was a genius like Dick Brevage and, and Andy McHugh. I, I thought, oh, the Sabre is full of these kinds of guys. Uh, and actually, there are a lot of guys that are awesome and gals that are in, in Sabre. Um, so no, I didn't think I could uh, feel the stardom. I wasn't really thinking along those lines. But I want to really, really quickly share one of my favorite uh, Sabre memories, uh, get it under the wire. And that and I'm going to out some people with this. But uh, the uh, Sabre convention was in Arlington, Texas in 1994. And uh, the, the ballpark, which doesn't even have the Rangers anymore was new at that time. Uh, but old Arlington was still there, although they were dismantling it, old Arlington Stadium. So Mark Rucker and myself, and I think Larry Gerlach and I think Rich Puff, I'm just gonna out all these guys. I'm not even sure if they were there, but I'm gonna claim they were there. We all went over to the ballpark to go to the, the Arlington ballpark, which was all, there's fencing all around it. You couldn't get in there. And I think it was Rucker who said, uh, hey, we should just jump the fence and go in there. And so I, we, everybody was like, okay, great. So I was the first one over and then the rest of them chickened out and they didn't go over. So they set me up. So I went into Arlington Stadium while it was uh, technically illegal to be in there. And it was only two people in the stadium, myself and a security guard on the other side of the ballpark who yelled at me and said, hey, stay where you are. <laughs> at which point I proceeded to leave because it was gonna take half an hour for him to get over to me. I wasn't really that panicked. But so I did get a chance to get to Arlington Stadium, which I had never been to before. I'm counting that on my Major League Baseball bar park list, even though it was completely empty. There were no seats. They were all piled up on the infield and it was being dismantled. There, that's my favorite baseball uh, Sabre memory. Fantastic. Well, I am going to quote that security guard to our audience and say, <laughs> hey, stay where you are, because <laughs> while we're saying goodbye to this distinguished panel of six wonderful guests. So thanks to all of you for being part of this. We are right about to welcome Mr. Howard Bryant for the eight o'clock Eastern show on 50 years of baseball. So stay where you are. I will figure out what I need to do, perhaps with some assistance from Sabre Top Brass to close out this panel and welcome Howard. So let's give that about a minute, but we're just jumping right in. I said no, I'm on. Not the video. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. Howard, welcome. And I think Ah, oh, good. I can hear you just fine so far. I got your note. You and I, it turns out, have a couple things in common. I'm also staying at a hotel 
with bad internet. So I actually went to a friend's <laughs> house at the last second and uh, so far so good, I think. Um, but we have something else in common. I think you have won two Casey Awards, if I'm keeping track. I have a Casey hat. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the similarities end soon. Um, so I don't know that you need any introduction to our audience other than I'm just going to say my personal opinion, my personal opinion here on the Mount Rushmore of baseball biographers. I have to say, Howard, you were there. I'm getting a chat from Sabre Top Brass to make sure I include Mark Armour. Uh, okay. All right. Sure. I, I wasn't going to go there, but we'll take Mark. Uh, maybe Jen Le <laughs> Jane Levy. We'll, we'll see who else. Um, but Howard, I want to say thank you so much for joining us. I just listened on, on part of my vacation drive uh, for the second time to your Sabercast with Rob Nyer interview to make sure I didn't accidentally ask you the same stuff Rob did. But luckily, uh, I am such an inferior interviewer to Rob Nyer that nothing he asked you uh, was even on my radar. Um, but I'm gonna open. I'm gonna open with uh, this. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm gonna open with this. Uh, your biography of Henry Aaron had either a title or subtitle of the Last Hero. And mm -hmm. number one, I loved that. But number two. I wanted to ask you to elaborate on what you meant by that. Is he the last baseball hero, the last American hero, the last sports hero? And what made you decide that maybe he is our last hero? Yeah, well, there's a lot there. And thanks for having me, everybody. I mean, I think this has been, um, it's always good to, to talk to uh, to any sort of Sabre audience is always so knowledgeable. I'm used to doing this in Western Mass with the chapter up there many times in the past. And um, with COVID and everything being what it is, it's difficult to do anything like this outside of Zoom. So I'm appreciative that, uh, that everyone's here and that we can talk a little bit uh, and talk a little baseball. Um, and Jason, especially since we've been going back and forth on Twitter and social media, it's good to interact with you a little bit more closely than... Uh, than on that hellscape that is, uh, that is Twitter. Um, the, the Henry Aaron book, The Last Hero, the, it, it was actually really interesting to me whether or not to even use that subtitle simply because how many lasts can you have? We had Jane Levy with The Last Boy and we had David Marinus's with his Clemente Baseball's Last Hero. And there were so many lasts. How can there be a last if there are so many lasts? Is anybody last if we're all last? And so to me, the reason why I went with that title was because I felt that where we were in 2005, when I had finished Juice in the Game and I was thinking about what the next project was going to be, and I had really sort of zeroing in on, on Henry and you know, not knowing at all if that project was going to take off at all, and I can talk about that in a minute, but um, the real reason for the title was that was the in the, the absolute height of the steroid era when I started to work on that book. Um, Bud Selig was completely adamant against any sort of investigation. So this is two years before the Mitchell report. The, there was a complete resistance on the part of the sport to even examine what we had been looking at. And when you started to think about what was happening in, in, in the game at that time, the home run record, Henry's record was the last one. That was the big one to fall. And so we'd already seen the big four fall, you know, we'd already seen, you know, Aaron, Ruth, Mays, Frank Robinson. I mean, that was the Mount Rushmore of home runs for forever for, you know, for 35, 40 years. And so this was supposed to be the, um, you know, and that's how it was supposed to be. It's how it had always been for so long for, for a certain generation. And so then you started to see that fall apart in terms of what that top four was going to look like. Then you started to see the, you know, a lot of the other records go. You started to see the single season records go. You started to see the uh, the idea of a 50 home run season go, but there was one record left that hadn't been touched and that was Henry's. And once you passed that, and especially after 2001, it really just seemed like this was the end of an era and that obviously there were gonna be other heroes, but for where we were, in that at that time period that record signified to me a real break from what we knew yeah fantastic well it was it's a it's a memorable 
title or, or subtitle. I, I think title and maybe the the um, uh, the Henry Aaron part is more the subtitle, if I'm remembering right from the cover. But uh, you are about to publish your Ricky Henderson biography. Yeah. And so we're, we're talking about two absolutely phenomenal heroes then that you've written about different eras. Uh, I think in terms of their style, uh, definitely different. I think there was always, you know, Henry Aaron is remembered for sort of understated elegance. Ricky, much more flashy. Henry Aaron, obviously the home runs, right? Ricky Henderson, obviously the stolen bases and and both were more yeah. multidimensional than just that. But they feel a little bit opposite in writing about Ricky and having written about Henry Aaron. What are some similarities that maybe surprised you or that you think would surprise other folks that that hadn't really had the chance to talk to either one? Yeah, well, I think that um, I'm really looking forward to having this book be finished, <laughs> to be honest. Um, but I think that the thing that gives me a lot of energy about this, I mean, there are plenty of similarities with greatness. You can always see those similarities. There's always when it comes to drive, when it comes to the determination, when it comes to the what, you know, what is their but is that coal made of when you're thinking about how that engine runs there there is a through line for for greatness i always thought about this in terms of doing the you know choosing ricky as a project i think anyone that's written a biography you really do have to make a, a serious effort to 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 make that right choice we're not all interested in everybody. Everyone doesn't interest us. There are certain people that you believe are deserving of biography, of not just a biography, but of your time. And there may be many people that you think are worthy of biography, but not for you to write them. Somebody has to decide that I want to give three, four, five, ten years of my life to this subject. And so to me, in in Henry's, in Ricky's case, the way that I have viewed the 20th century, which really is the century of the rise of professional sports, of sports as a mega industry, that to me, it was three waves, really three waves. And the first wave, especially from a baseball standpoint, because baseball was king back then, it was the immigrant story. And so in baseball, this is how the industrial revolution and the immigration times of the 1800s and the early 1900s baseball was a way that a lot of that generation of children became americans um whether you're talking about the irish whether you're talking about the the germans or the italians or the poles or whomever and you know this was their entree into into the american story and then obviously the second the second wave is the integration story. You get to Jackie Robinson and now suddenly your national, your national game has to include everybody. So the integration story does take over beginning, you know, pretty much 1945 and on when Jackie Robinson is signed and obviously previously to that, but that's when the integration story sort of begins. And then the third story is the, the economic story. It's the story of money. It's the story of labor. It's the story of the end of the reserve clause. It's the 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 Mookie Betts and Mike Trout um, super contracts preceded by free agency and Mr. Smith and McNally and the rest of all of that reserve clause story. And I felt like that story was the one that had to be talked about. However, it's very, very difficult to talk about it. I think that I talk about it a little bit uh, in Juicing the Game. John Hellyer does a terrific job with it in uh, Lords of the Realm. There's also some other areas. I think Chuck Core did a great job in the end of baseball as, as we know it. There's all kinds of different scholarship there, but in terms of biography, it's it's been a really hard place to get to. And one of the reasons it's been hard to get to is because a lot of publishers don't want to hear it. A lot of fans necessarily don't want to hear it. It's not necessarily a heroic story. It's not a happy ending. The one thing we know about the money in the game is that it has distanced the fan from the player. So how do you get to this piece of the story? And to me, Ricky really does represent a lot of that. Ricky is a guy, um, in addition to simply being hilarious and all the Ricky stories in the third person and all that, that was one of the reasons for wanting to do the story because I really just enjoyed him as a player. But he also allows you to get to this topic that I feel very strongly about. And that is when you go through his career, he was not a popular player. I mean, Ricky was loved by fans, but if you go back and read the day by days, go do the research, 
people were very offended by him as a player. And I think once you start to get to the strike, you know, the arc of the book really is that here's a guy who epitomized that anger and that distance that people felt coming out of free agency. And then all of a sudden, he becomes this cross between Yogi Berra and Satchel Paige. And so that's sort of the Ricky arc, but a lot of that story is the economic story of how, you know, this guy was not considered the type of player that um, was worthy of the, you know, of those Aaron Mantle maze, you know, of that pantheon. And then the numbers just changed everything, that he was just so damn good. You couldn't deny what he had, what he had done, you know, and then you start looking at the numbers and you go, my goodness. And that isn't even that, that part of the story isn't even talking about Ricky as a character. So it's who you choose as a bio, you know, as a biography subject really does have to, um, it has to really have a, a, a deeper thesis that is going to keep you interested for the next several years. Yeah, it's it's funny when uh, when you gave those three essentially chapters or eras in baseball history, and you talked about the economic story, right? What was going through my head was the phrase "millionaires versus billionaires," right? When when yeah, hundred percent. There's sort of not a hero you're rooting for if you frame it that way, but well, that's right, time, right? I mean, at the same time, you can look at Ricky Henderson, and there's definitely a rags to riches story, which is so quintessentially you know American, at least in terms of our mythology. So I suppose I suppose through that lens, obviously, um, quite a hero. But your subtitle here is the life and legend of an American original, and so I'm always I'm always intrigued um, by the subtitles. Um, American well, it's original. important to remember, Jason, that I was going to say, you know, I don't want to cut you off. I'll be really quick really? on this, but let the record show that we don't have, you know, the author does not have final say on cover or title. Oh, and true. so, and I'm 0 for 2 on both of those <laughs> because I lost the cover battle. I think it's a nice cover, but it wasn't my yeah. first choice. Hmm. And I lost the title battle. Um the title, my original title was was Ricky Henderson and the Legend of Oakland. It was really an Oakland oh, wow. book. It was all about yeah. the beginnings of, you know, that Ricky was a guy who comes from this incredible heritage and legacy of Oakland baseball and ended up eclipsing everybody. You could make an argument. He's the greatest baseball player to come out of Oakland in a place that had Frank Robinson. Right. I lost that battle because the publisher thought it was too regional. OK, fine. So then I thought it was also going to be the you know, just the legend of an, of an American original because so much of Ricky is, did he really say this? Did he not say this? You've got all of these different sort of Ricky stories. People are fascinated by the character, the individual character that is Ricky Henderson. Um, the life and legend of an American original, it was, it was my title, but it wasn't my favorite title simply because I thought it was a little chunky. Um, but I had life in there at also because I didn't want it, I didn't want anyone to think, or I didn't want to feel like I was writing a book that was going to be 350 pages of did he say this or didn't he say this? There's a real story to Ricky Henderson. He, you know, by the time you begin to look at him as a player, you could make an argument, he's one of the top five position players of all time. And so, you know, we can frame him as sort of a clown or a joke or whatever, but this guy's a legitimate, legitimate baseball player. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So let me let me take us in a different direction. So part of what we're doing tonight is reflecting on 50 years, uh, whether it's of Sabre or of baseball. And so uh, the Sabre era of baseball, which I'll, I'll just call 1971 to 2021, gives us the 70s, the 80s, the 90s and the more modern decades. Do you have a favorite decade or a favorite era as a fan? Uh, it may be different as a writer, but as a fan, uh, when you thought the game was the most exciting, the most fun, the most gratifying? Well, I think you always protect your time, right? You always protect when you came to the game. Yeah. And that's very, very difficult to, to make an argument that you came to a game you didn't like. And then there was another, you know, then there was another uh, period that was better. I came in in the 70s. I came in, 75 Red Sox brought me in, right? I mean, you know, Gold Dust Twins, Fisk, Tion, Billy, all of it. That's my, that's my time. And obviously as a teenager, you're in, you know, 80s baseball. 
I, I still look at that as the period for me. That's the period where it was the most interesting. That was the period where it was the most fun. It's also the period where it was the most integrated, right? And so you start looking at everyone keeps talking about all these numbers and who's playing the game and who's attracted to the game. It was also the period where it was the most national. I talked to Reggie Jackson about this all the time, and he loves to, of course, Reggie will remind you, if you didn't know already, that he's the, he really is between him and maybe Griffey in the early 90s, the last time the sport was national. I and mean, baseball has chosen to make this sport regional. I believe that baseball has made this a, a business strategy, a strategic choice. I don't believe that you simply feel that the only thing that matters is the team in your area code or the teams in your division. Because I grew up at a time when baseball felt national to me. Maybe it's because I was a kid and I was a big baseball fan. But I do believe that, I mean, they don't call it the regional pastime. It's the national pastime. There's a reason, reason why it is that. And maybe that's anachronistic, but I don't think so. I think they made a business choice. So I really do, I'm a, I'm a mid seventies to mid eighties guy when it comes to when I thought the game was at its best. Um, obviously as a, as a person who follows the history, I would have loved to have watched the game in the fifties. Um, I would have loved to watch the National League in the 50s. And the, the contrast between the National League and the American League is they were really different games because of integration. Obviously, it would have been incredible to watch the game, you know, in the 1930s when there was so much offense or in the 20s when the game was just very, very different as well. But to me, I, uh, you know, I, I like the um, 70s and 80s because, because you had to be complete players back then. You know, you really did. I mean, you don't have to be a complete player today, but you pretty much had to be a complete player back then. So, Howard, it's interesting. You kind of led with something that was almost going to be my follow-up because I, I have a theory. I've talked to so many people where I ask them, what was your favorite uh, era? When did you think baseball was at its best? And coincidentally, it almost always coincides, uh, coincides pardon me, with when they were a kid. Right. Yeah, of course. So, yeah. Uh, right. So maybe maybe it's we who've changed more more than the game. But nonetheless, I'm going to go there and I'm going to say if baseball was at its best, let's say in the late 70s or early 80s. And by the way, that, that's what I choose also. Um, I'm going to ask anyways, what messed it up? How did it get worse? How did we get where we are now? Assuming the, the glory years were were, let's say, 40 years in the past. Yeah, it's an interesting question because I, I make it, it's, a, it's an interesting argument. It's a, it's a dual argument, right? I mean, you make these arguments for, you make these arguments for basketball. I'm a huge basketball fan as well, right? And there's no question that basketball is in a lot of ways unwatchable. It's like a horrible game in so many ways, right? It's horrible. It's essentially when you watch basketball, Basketball is now a game of misses. When you, when I came to the game, basketball was a game of makes, right? If you were a good shooter, you made 50% of your shots, you made 80% of your free throws, right? For the most part, that's the sport. It's a game of makes. We watch the ball go into the basket. That's why you score 120 points a game. But now with, because of the analytics, the analytics are suggesting that now E, e efficiency is you know, how many three-pointers do you have to make to, I mean, how many two-pointers do you have to make in terms of percentage to make up for the extra point with a three-pointer? So now it's a game of, of misses. You can shoot 40% from three and have the same percentage of points as if you're shooting 60% from two. And most people don't shoot 60% from two. However, for all of what we're talking about when it comes to basketball, these guys are amazing. These basketball players today are the most athletic. They are the best athletes in the world. They're the best shooters they're, the shooting today is better than my time when I'm a, you know, I'm a bird magic guy, you know, it's a way better game in terms of what these guys can do, but I like that game better. When it comes to baseball, it's similar, right? Baseball, if you were, you know, what's the very first thing you have to do if you're going to be a baseball player? You got to make contact. Today, they don't care if you make contact. Today, the, the idea of how you play the sport is different from when we came to it. You can strike out 185 times a day. They don't care. It's not, these things are not emphasized anymore. And so it's a very, um, it's, a, it's a great question. So like you could make the argument that what you're watching today is far more athletic and far more gifted than what we saw, but the sport is played differently. And I think that obviously there's, you know, and this is, this may just be, I mean, this is me talking, you're asking me the question, I'm not speaking for anybody but myself. 
Um, obviously, the drugs had a lot to do with it in terms of changing what happened and how the game was played. There's no question about that in my mind in terms of, you know, how we how we saw the sport. Um, the game, the physical game of baseball is evaluated differently today. It's just a different game. And this is what happens. Games change. Game, things are emphasized differently today. You know, you watch, you know, like football is a better game today than it was before. I mean, I, when I was a kid, it was like, you know, how many more times am I going to watch a third and nine draw play? Throw the goddamn ball, right? I mean, back then, this is what the sport was. Today, it's different, right? So I think when, when I watch baseball, when, I, where I, when you ask the question, where did it all go wrong? Um, to me, it went wrong in terms of the evaluation of risk. Um, that I remember talking to J.P. Rashadi about this when he was a GM of the, of the Blue Jays. And the whole conversation was about how do you produce? Like, you know, I'm thinking about this with the Ricky book as well. And Ricky talks about what's the name of the game. The name of the game is to score runs, right? That's the big thing with him. He's like, people love me for stolen bases, but I'm most proud of scoring more runs than anybody who ever played the game. And so talking to JP about this, you know, right when you start getting to the late, late nineties, the argument was we don't give up outs to score runs anymore. So all we're doing now is trying to maximize the way to score runs. And I think it just took away a lot of the athleticism of the sport. And so baseball just doesn't feel as dynamic. It doesn't feel as athletic. Um, some of this is unavoidable. I remember talking to Joe Torrey about this, about replay. I don't think Ricky Henderson could be Ricky Henderson today because how many times would he be called out because of replay? Did he pop off the bag one one hundredth of a millimeter, you know, off the bag and now he's out? Um, baseball players today, uh, baseball evaluators want you to steal bases at an 85 percent clip. I mean, nobody steals, but even Ricky at his best only eclipsed 85 percent a couple of times. So if these are the prerequisites, you're going to have a far less interesting, a far less dynamic, far less risk-based game. And it becomes sort of a, you know, it's a boom or bust game. I remember talking to Don Fear about this. All sports have moved in this direction. So I don't want to separate baseball and, and say that baseball is somehow different from the rest. It's all boom or bust now, right? Basketball, it's, you know, three-pointers and dunks. Football, you chuck the ball downfield and try to get a pass interference call. You know, baseball, it's home runs and strikeouts. This maximizing of offense, the it, it takes away from the, the dynamism of the actual sport. All the sports are going in this direction. Yeah, it's, it's funny, as you were saying that, I was picturing with, with Ricky Henderson himself, right, at a point in his career where he was starting to have a, a great deal of success. If somebody had said to him, would it surprise you that you might be regarded as one of the greatest players in, in history by the time you retire? He, he might say, no, not really. Maybe I wouldn't be surprised. But if you said, and, and it would be because of your bases on balls, not your not your stolen bases, right? I mean, I think in a way that yeah. is, uh, you know, it sort of ups ups his numbers in, in the way we, we look at his performance. Yeah, when you think about it, I mean, when you start thinking about things that you're never going to see again, obviously, you know, nobody's going to win 511 games anymore. Yeah. That's done, right? That forget it. It's not. No one's. Very few guys going to win three hundred. I don't know who the next three hundred game winner is going to be, right? So we know that part of the game is over. Ricky, nobody's getting fourteen oh six. Right. The way the game is played right now, fourteen hundred stolen bases. I mean, what I always find fascinating about about Ricky, and I know I'm just I got Ricky on the brain right now, but. Um, there's only one other record that I can really think of all time. Most all time records, you break all time records when you're at the end, because it takes that long. That's what it takes to get to the record. It takes a career. It takes a lifetime in the sport to get to the end of a record, right? The only one that I can really think of where you had a reigning record, career record holder while he was playing was Babe Ruth because they changed the ball. Babe Ruth was the all time record leader, home run leader in 1921. He held the record for 14 years, right? As an active player, he, was, he just kept adding to his record, right? Ricky, Ricky broke the all-time stolen base record, but he was 32. He carried that record for 12 years as an active player. I mean, it's just, it's just stunning. Certain things you're just not going to see again. Yeah, that was, that was amazing. So I set up uh, my next question for you because, Howard, I think you are one of the best in terms of challenging mythology and uh, holding up the mirror of truth sometimes. So uh, I'm not sure which way you'll go on this, but I'm going to say uh, if we were to dial back to 1971 and we were to look at where baseball 
sat among the major sports. I think it would unquestionably mm -hmm. have been at the top. The, the NBA was, it was, you know, kind of under the radar for a lot of fans. Uh, the NFL, I think the Joe Namath Super Bowl did a little something, but for the most part, uh, nobody could compete with baseball. And nowadays, I think a question we often hear is how can baseball compete with these other sports? Do you think yeah. uh, that baseball was simply overrated before? Or do you think these other sports have really uh, sort of uh, like, what, what do you think that's about? Is, is it realistic that baseball might regain the top spot at some point? Or was it just that maybe we didn't really deserve it uh, when we had it? Yeah, well, I'm going to disagree with you on that. Baseball okay. was falling apart. Baseball was falling apart in the late 50s, early 60s. Okay. Um, by the by, the time you get to the 70s, baseball is the second sport, at least in terms of viewership. Football had taken it over. Okay. You know, football is a made-for-TV sport. Um, I remember when I was doing some, I don't know if it was Aaron research or whatever research or just messing around, whatever I was doing. There were stories in the in the early 50s about is baseball too boring? Is baseball too long? Does the game, you know, is there some way to speed up the game? They were talking about it. Those games were an hour and 54 minutes. <laughs> we're saying that the game was too short. So this is something that has been going on with baseball for a long time. Um, do I ever perceive see baseball being the number one sport again? Probably not, um, simply because I think that the, the, the world has changed. I think that baseball is a very literate sport. Baseball, I, you know, I, I realized that for me, like there are reasons why like my favorite genre of movies are like Westerns, right? My favorite sports, baseball. I mean, I think there's a connection there. And, and to me, the connection is, is that you, the, the two are the same, like, you know, Western, you pretty much watch a Western and for a lot of the movie, nothing happens. But then when something happens, it's big and it happens fast and it's bang. And it's like, whoa, there's your movie. Baseball's the same way. You go the whole way and nothing happens and then shit, something happens. Right. And then I'll hear it. And then here it comes, you know, there's a, you know, the, the six run fifth with two outs, all of a sudden, the, you know, the, the dam breaks. And so I don't know if we view sports that way anymore. I don't think we watch sports that way. I don't think the culture lives itself that way. We don't read that way. It's a, it's a literate game. It requires time and it requires patience and it requires all of these different things that we just don't seem to value very much anymore. Um, that doesn't mean that we don't, we, we won't. It just means that we don't right now. Um, and I think also, I think baseball is paying a severe price for something that has that has plagued it for decades, which is that the game, when we talk about the unwritten rules and all of these things, baseball, every sport has unwritten rules. The problem is, is that baseball's unwritten rules are rooted in racism. They're rooted in xenophobia. They're rooted in all the things that you know, were supposed to go away when Jackie Robinson came. Like, you know, when you watch the sport, the difference between baseball and say basketball is that basketball adjusts to the people who play it. At one point, they, you know, basketball was a, was a white Jewish game. Then it became a black game. Now it's a black urban game. And here we go. And the NBA adapts to the people who play it. You don't have, you know, people, you know, you don't get punched in the face for dunking the basketball when, you know, this is, this is how the game is played now. Baseball has never really adapted to the people who play it. Baseball still wants to be, you know, a white ethnic Southern game. And the people who play it, when you watch the way baseball is played around the world, they don't play it that way. Go watch baseball in Korea. They flip the bat and they do whatever they want to do. You know, you watch, you know, watch a winter league game, watch a Caribbean world series game, watch the way the game is played, watch a Negro league game, watch the game being played in the, you know, watch an RBI game or watch a, a pickup game up in, in Washington Heights. The game is played very differently because the people playing it are different. And baseball has never really adjusted to the people who play it. Baseball makes you ad ad adapt to it. And that's why you see stories like Tim Anderson saying, I've never seen Field of Dreams before or whatever. All of these things all come together. And so you, you pay a price for that, especially when your culture evolves from words to pictures. We are an image-based society now. You know, we watch television, we watch movies. We're not into the words anymore. So therefore the sport itself has not adapted to the people who play it. It hasn't really adapted well to the culture that it's in. And it has found itself doing something that to me is very, very difficult, which is, you know, it may offend the sensibilities of, of our saber brethren here, but, you know, you're trying to sell a game of, uh, of you're trying to sell the, 
in, in a culture of images, you're trying to sell the game through science. And that's really, really hard to do. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're, we're all about the truth. So uh, no offense taken at all, I'm sure. But let me ask, yeah. let me ask you this question, because as you were talking, it, it, it made me circle a question that I had for you. And I think I'm going to promote it and ask it now. Um, and, and maybe there's a second aspect I'll ask as well. Um, do you think the way that Major League Baseball operates, uh, where they look for talent, what they perceive of as Major League talent or maybe potential all-star talent, do you think if Henry Aaron, instead of coming up in, in the early 1950s, or Ricky Henderson, and instead of coming up in the mid-1970s, were coming up now, would they even be noticed? Um, would, 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 would they team... even be baseball players? Right. I mean, that's the other thing, is that, is that right. baseball... Baseball also isn't competing. Like you know, all of these things. Like people get so disappointed about these conversations. Like they get pissed off about stuff because they they feel protective of their space and they feel protective of their game. But you're really dealing with all kinds of different forces that are that are apolitical, right? These things are happening, and you have to deal with what's happening. I was happy that you brought up 1971 a little while ago, and you know, every time I hear this idea about oh well, you know. Um, you know, black kids aren't playing the game anymore and the numbers are down to 7.7% or whatever. And 71 is obviously extremely important because of you know, the September, you know, 71, where the Pirates had the first, you know, black and brown, you know, non-white lineup in the game. And, you know, once again, the, the sport has made a decision about where it's going to go. I've always said, if you look for talent, you're going to find it. And baseball looks for talent in the Dominican Republic and Central America, I mean, I'm sorry, Latin America. And this is where, this is where they look for their talent. And so you're changed. So you've, you've completely sort of changed the sport in terms of where you look for talent, who's going to play the game, how the game is presented. Right. And so you also simultaneously to that have to compete for players today in a way that you never had to compete for them before. I mean, remember the old line about baseball, you know, and, you know, or, or football, you know, do you want a big league contract or do you want a limp, right? I mean, the money is big enough now that you're competing. How are you going to compete for talent? Baseball does not really truly have a mechanism yet where it feels like it's going to compete for a talent. So if Henry Aaron comes up and Henry Aaron is wanted by the Minnesota Vikings and the Minnesota Twins, baseball is not equipped to compete for Henry Aaron. I mean, look what happened with the Oakland A's and Kyler Murray, right? And it wasn't just the fact that Kyler Murray wanted to play football. It was the fact that baseball didn't really have a mechanism for competing with him, even though ultimately his choice was football and the A's, the A's took a shot. Um, you know, and so because of that, you, you really aren't quite sure what type of player you're going to get today, who you're looking at. I've always said to be, that baseball today is a, is a white suburban game reinforced by foreign labor. I mean, that's really how it works right now. And that really does change how the game is played, who gets to play it, how we look at the game, all of it. It's, um, and these are all business choices. And so that's one of the reasons why I don't have necessarily this great lament about what's taking place as if it's inevitable. You may get a business choice. You've made business choices right now. And now everyone is dealing with the consequences of those business choices. Yeah. So so uh, this may be a little bit uh, unfair because I'm going to put you in the role of commissioner for a day, and it might be that it would take 20 years to really have impact. But commissioner for a day, Howard Bryant, um, if, if you were reigning over baseball and had near absolute power to make some changes that you thought would make the game much healthier, much more relevant, uh, not just for today, but into the future, what are, what are some things that you think someone like a commissioner could do? And I know sometimes there are, there are norms that are sort of beyond just one person, but uh, what are things that you think could help the game? Well, personally, I would go backwards, <laughs> right? So this is me, right? Talking about how the game's not modern, how the game isn't doing enough to be modern. And I'm like, I wanna go back to the past, right? Mm -hmm. To me, and Bud and I used to talk about this all the time. And, you know, it, it, it's like, you have to realize what makes you special. I think that baseball is problematic in a couple of ways. And some of the ways, it's not the game's fault, right? I grew up in Boston. And because I was in a one-team city, the all-star game was really important to me. 
it was the only time we got to see Mike Schmidt and we got to see Dale Murphy and we got to see, you know, all of those national league guys, you got to see Steve Carlton, you know, we never got to see him, you know, except for the all-star game in the world series. And then of course the game of the week was always Cubs Cardinals, or, you know, maybe you'd get the Dodgers, but it was always the friggin' it was always the middle. It was always the Cardinals. It was the middle, you know, the middle of the country. So, and the Cubs were never any good anyway. So the teams that you saw, you really get to see the great players then. Technology has wiped out the all-star game. You can't argue that point. It's done. You know, now that you've got, you know, the package and you've got, you know, 300 channels, there's really nothing you can do with the all-star game. now. I just don't think, right? However, I think it's really difficult to ask people to play. I don't think you can play the game every day under two sets of rules. I think that's a total disaster. I think it's awful. Um, I think that baseball needs to go backwards and remind people why it's special. I don't need interleague play in my life. I really don't. I think that the sport is special because they were two separate businesses. I don't think you necessarily need an NL and an AL commissioner anymore, but I think the uniqueness of baseball is that very thing that these two, you know, these two leagues don't play each other until the world series. I think that's kind of cool. I still like that. Does that grow the game? I don't know, but it makes me happy. Right. Um, I think in terms of the growing of the sport, I think that you absolutely, and Sandy Alderson and I used to have this argument and people get upset about it, but I really do believe that baseball has to figure something out in terms of, I think you have to get rid of the draft. You have to find some other way to compete for players um, because right now you, and, and you have to pay minor leaguers, Tara Krieger, absolutely. Um, I think that you, know, you have to do all of these things, but what you really have to do is is you have to give people incentive to play this sport. And if you're going, if you want the best athletes, if you want people to play this game, you cannot have a lot of your best athletes be scooped away by football and by, by basketball because you don't wanna compete for them, right? So I think that people in baseball, I think people would love baseball more if you had American academies that actually gave control to a lot of players instead of the draft, like, you know, there's no incentive to develop American players anymore, right? There's no incentive. There's no incentive to compete against basketball and football players, right? You look at a guy like Russell Wilson, baseball player. You look at a guy like Jameis Winston, baseball player, you know, look at a guy like Kyler Murray, baseball player. It's not like they're not playing the sport. They're making a choice to leave the sport. And so look at Pat Mahomes and his dad, they're all baseball players. Right. And so when I was covering the Washington football team back in the mid 2000s, I was talking to all these guys, you know, Santana Moss and Sean Taylor and Ronaldo Wynn, who was 300 pounds. And he was saying they all played baseball and then they phased out of baseball. Why? Because they get paid to go to college to play football. And so when you look for players, you're going to find them. And where does baseball go? Baseball is looking away from where the talent is because it doesn't know how to compete because baseball is looking, baseball doesn't want unfinished athletes anymore. It wants the colleges to develop them, but there's no money, you know, college is a non-revenue sport. Ba college baseball is non-revenue. So you're just not even getting the talent. You're not even, you're not even looking for athleticism. You're not trying to make the game dynamic. And you have completely, completely, you know, surrendered. You've surrendered so much territory, it's gonna be really difficult to get it back. So, so now I have to ask the follow-up. I, I mentioned if you were commissioner for a day or maybe 20 years. What would I do? Well, well, that'll be I part didn't really of answer it, that but... question, did I? I didn't say exactly what I would do. I just ranted. So <laughs> what I would do, the first thing I would do is you would have to figure out a way, you know, whether you go back and you go back to your old systems of paying minor leaguers and developing players at home and giving them some competition you have to compete with the other sports you have to you if you can't compete with them then you're dead right you have to you know create for um for your fan base an exciting product um that's one of the first things i would do the next thing i would do is i would i would hire the very best marketing people in the world to say i want this game national again I, I don't want to I don't want to cede territory to Tom Brady and LeBron James and Damian Lillard and everybody else that that I, I you know unless you have just absolutely concluded that people in this country do not care about your players, you have to fight for that territory and get this game back. Um, 
I didn't have a huge problem necessarily with um, some of the change that they tried to make during the pandemic. Um, I didn't like the fact that it was inconsistent. I mean, you're playing under three sets of rules every single day. You've got a DH, you know, now you're playing interleague. And now sometimes some teams play seven innings and some teams don't. So all of that stuff is a, is a mess. You have to streamline the sport. I know there's a big movement coming over the next few years about regionalizing the game and doing, you know, instead of having American and National League teams not play each other until the World Series, having an, you know, an East, Midwest, West League where the East and the South play each other and the West and the Midwest play each other and then those two champions play. Um, there is something interesting about that, but I don't think I'd want to lose the Red Sox and the A's playing each other. But I do feel like the number one thing you have to do is you have to believe in your sport. And I don't think that the people who run this sport really believe in the viability of baseball as a game and they keep chasing stuff and it looks desperate and you can't look desperate. You have to believe in what you're selling. Wow. So, so in that case, let me go to this follow-up question. If asked, would you serve? As a commissioner? Of course not. <laughs> why would I work for the owners? Why? So the owners, the owners could have the satisfaction of firing me before lunchtime? Of course not. <laughs> well, you, you might, you, you'd have my support. I don't, I don't That might get you to 1201. Probably not, but uh, <laughs> okay. Oh, uh, I, haven't, I haven't finished my creme brulee. Oh, there's more. There's more. Right? <laughs> oh, no. Right? Right. Put me out of a job. All right, I'm gonna go. Uh, I'll call this the speed round a little bit. Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't mean you have to rush your answers at all. Um, but uh, in looking at 50 years of baseball, right? Uh, obviously, the game is not as fun as exciting as when we were kids, and that's partly because of us. But neither and, are we. Yeah. It, yeah. <laughs> oh, for sure. For sure. Um, in the last 50 years, for some of these things. Um, are things better or worse? Um, and, and probably it's a mix and there's trade-offs and all of that. Um, front office hiring, uh, particularly women and minorities, um, do you think we've made real strides or uh, that, that for where we are, uh, we're nowhere near where we should be? Oh, it's horrible. Um, you know, it's, it's horrible, but it's, it's what they want, right? I mean, this is, baseball, has decided that it's going to be uh, run like a Fortune 500 company. I mean, this is what they want it to look like. Um, they want it to look like McKinsey. They want it to look like Wall Street. This is how they how they hire. So, um, yeah, I don't I don't think it's ever really been a priority. I mean, it's a priority when people complain about it, but it's not a mission statement. I mean, you do things if you do things because people are forcing you to do it. I mean, where's the passion in that, right? I mean. Baseball is, let's just put it this way. Baseball is getting exactly what the people who run the sport want right now. It's not like they're helpless. They're doing, they have an idea of what they want the game to be. Did I lose you? Is everyone gone? I was going to say, this is sort of hilarious. Could somebody ask questions then? Yeah. Now that we've lost hey, how are you? <laughs> I am good. Somebody jump in. Let's just, we'll do our own speed round yeah, because Jason right. has clearly well, had enough of me. We'll let, we'll let this roll. Uh, we'll let this roll while uh, Jason figures out his internet. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I'm, I'm scrambling in here to uh, catch up on questions. So, you know, it was, it was interesting to me um, talking about your conversations with, uh, with Bud Selig. Um, you know, because I think one of the one of the comments that, that I would make about the current commissioner setup compared to when uh, when Bud was in charge, and you touched on this a little bit with the front office composition. You know, they're looking for they're looking for Wall Street executives, they're looking for Ivy Leaguers, and in in some ways, to me, Bud's Bud's background um, being really from the Midwest at his core, um, sort of. He was very folksy, I guess. Uh, do, do you think? Do you think that that has contributed to um, a lot of the changes as well? You know, just just sort of the background of of the commissioner himself. 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, I see Donna has a question here, and I will be very quick. Favorite player growing up was Dave Winfield. Okay, Scott. So um, I would say 100%, right? Um, I would say that Bud was of that last generation where he believed that the game was a, you know, that, that the commissioner's office was a custodian. Um, but he was also an owner. And so, you know, whenever I talked to Bud about this, Bud used to tell me that there was not a single commissioner in the game who was his idol, that the guy that he really wanted to, to model himself after was Pete Rozelle. He was completely offended by the fact that baseball had all these wild cards, whether it was Steinbrenner or, um, you know, whether it was Steinbrenner or whether it was Ted Turner or all of them. Um, he wanted no Mavericks. And if you look at what baseball is now, all the owners are in line. There's, there are no, there are no more George Steinbrenners and no more Ted Turner's and, you know, you know, no, no more Peter Angelos even though he still owns the team. None of those guys, you know, they're not there anymore. And that's what Bud wanted. Bud, Bud looked at the 94 strike and he saw that I can make all of you guys money and all of us can get along better if we just stay in line. And if you look at what's happened, the sport is sort of less interesting, um, but they're far richer than they were before. That's right. Jason's back. Yeah. Jason's back. So I, I, I fear, Scott, that I may have just played Wally Pip to your Lou Gehrig. Absolutely. Um, yes, <laughs> right, you're back. Um, and I will just jump in with uh, M Emily Ruth Rudder's question about um, uh, my thoughts on the elevation of Negro League stats. I'll just come out and say it. I hate it. 100% hate it, hate it, hate it. Mistake. I, you know, John Thorne and I argue this point. I have respect for John. I just think it's a, I think it's a horrible mistake. And I felt like, and, and for numerous reasons. Um, one, we are selling the message to a generation. Um, for us, we get it. We're old. We're not going to live forever. Um, so we know the difference. We know what happened with the Negro Leagues. We know how baseball viewed the Negro Leagues, but that's not gonna last over time. Over time, the history is going to be muddied. The history is going to be distorted. The history is gonna be misdirected and people are going to look at this and they're going to say, oh, well, everybody was equal. And they're not going to, you know, they're gonna look at the statistics. Like I just got, you know, I hop on baseball reference or wherever I was and somebody was talking about Willie Wells was a 10 time all, you know, NL Negro League All-Star. And I'm like, notice how legitimate that sounds but it wasn't legitimate. They were legitimate, the players were legitimate, but the way that the sport viewed them, the way that the country viewed them, they viewed them with total contempt. And if you're going to simply with a pen stroke, make them equal when everybody's dead, you still have to find some way to account for that contempt if you're going to be accurate, if you're going to tell the story the way it was. And I have a major problem with that. I, and I also, the biggest problem that I had with it was the fact that I had been told many times by people in baseball that this was a reaction to what was happening in the country after George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Jacob Blake and everything else. And that it's not a move that they would have made in 2021 or 2019. I'm like, well, if you can't hold up to that, that measure, if you wouldn't do this every year, then you shouldn't do it any year. There were all kinds of different things that baseball could have done if they wanted to recognize the Negro Leagues. Um, but messing with the numbers and messing with the history and messing with the batting average and, 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 and all of those things, it's just not it. It's just, it was the wrong move. I understood it. I understood that the players, that if, if some of the players were alive, maybe it would have been different. So the Satchel Pages and the rest of those guys could have felt that they had gotten some of their respect. But my attitude on this has always been that, the, that, that if the players, those black players who knew in real time that the sport viewed them as inferior. And they had to carry that for their whole lives. And you had guys like Bob Feller saying, oh, there's not a single Negro leaguer who could play in the big leagues, right? If those players and their families have to carry that, then the institution of baseball has to carry what they did to them. They have to carry it equally. If you wanna you know, support the Jackie Robinson Foundation and support the Negro League Museum in perpetuity to keep telling the history, that's great, that's fine. But don't mess with the numbers and don't tell me that what took place in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s was something that it wasn't, because it's it it it's insulting, really. So 
Howard, I'm I'm back, and I think as as you're saying this, I'm reminded of an article I think you wrote maybe a couple days after the announcement, if I'm remembering right, mm -hmm. um, making making some of those points, and and it made me sad to read, but of course, like a lot of your writing, I thought about it, and I said, well, he is right. A lot of my writing makes you sad. How terrible, Jason! How awful. <laughs> Because I thought this is great. And then I read and I thought, well, Howard makes some really good points. Though. Um, so let me do this. We're just at about eight minutes to go. And so many questions have come in. Uh, well, I'm looking at them. Do you want me to just do your job for you, Jason? I can absolutely say I'm looking at Vicky right now. Yes, Vicky. Um, okay. Ricky Henderson, 1978, one of my all time favorite chapters. I think it's chapter five or chapter six. It's it's really hilarious in a lot of ways. Um, I wish I could tell you this story very quickly um, about Ricky. Ricky calling the home, you know, Ricky calling the, the, the press box during a game because uh, um, a hit was called an error. And he actually calls the press box, you know, during the game, demanding that the hit be changed. Um, and also the fact that Charlie Finley was so cheap that when the um, the Cleveland Indians went to Nashville, the A's switched franchises with them, but they didn't switch jerseys. So they were not the Jersey City A's. They were the Jersey City Indians. And so if you go back and look at the uniforms, the Oakland A's were wearing Cleveland Indians colors for the entire minor league season of 1978. Uh, Harry Keller, what are we in for with the coming CBA battle? As Clubber Lang said in Rocky Three, pain. <laughs> Lots of pain. I expect um, a really nasty battle, and I don't think it's going to be pretty at all. Um, an exceptional guest. Thank you, Dan Evans. Is that Dan Evans from the Dodgers? Um, um, my favorite baseball experience. There are just too many to count. Probably, I just love. I, I love spring training. I mean, the old spring training when it was really it wasn't a revenue stream. It was just. I mean, I'm not that old, but I remember even my first few years in the mid '90s that it just early nineties, it just felt great um, being down there. But my favorite individual baseball experience was game seven, 2003 um, ALCS. I'm on the field with, with Willie Randolph and we're talking about this game. And I say to Willie, so what do you think? And I, I said, you know, you know, this Red Sox team is, di is dynamite. And he's like, yeah, they're really good. They're really good. They might be better than us, but I'll tell you something. I've been around here a long time. And whenever we've had to beat them, we've always beaten them. And tonight's not going to be any different. And that game, just from start to finish, and when I say finish, I mean at the end, after Aaron Boone and, you know, we've seen it crying in the clubhouse and the whole thing, the Red Sox bus is pulling out. And here comes George Steinbrenner at like, it's like 1.40 in the morning, 2 o'clock in the morning. He's got his dark sunglasses on and he's trolling the Red Sox bus. He waves at the Red Sox bus and he says, we win again. And he walks away. It was just one of the most bizarre nights of my life, but an amazing, amazing game. Um, also, um, Aaron Boone hits the home run and right next to us in the Yankee Stadium press box is the, you know, the Yankee skybox. And there's Gene Afterman, Reggie Jackson, uh, Brian Cashman, and Randy Levine. They're all hugging each other. They're all jumping up and down because they're, you know, Mariano Rivera runs to the mound and just lays on the mound. So it's bizarre. Like if you're looking, you see Aaron Boone rounding second, but you see Mariano Rivera on the mound. Right? He's laying on the mound before this is even done. And Randy Levine goes to the edge of the press box and he's like 10 feet from me and he screams, take that you 1918 pieces of shit. And then you take that and then you look at what happened the very next year. Unbelievable. Clearly the greatest baseball period of my life. Those, those as a professional covering the 04, 05 period was ridiculous. Um, what do we see else here? Ricky, yes. Last year on my Dodger club, yes, Ricky. 2003, Ricky Henderson with the Dodgers, and then goes and plays for the Newark Bears, thinking that he was going to catch on with another team. Ricky actually has never officially retired. And I talked to Ricky last year before the pandemic. I was with him in um, in Mesa with the Cubs, with the Cubs, with the A's, old school. And um, and uh, I said, Ricky, you know, you never officially retired. And he says, Yeah, I think I can still help a team. I'm like, You're 62. So that's Ricky for you. 61 at the time. Howard, did you see Daryl had a question? It's, it's, you got to scroll up a this. bit, but uh, he's saying, given what you accurately say about developing talent, frankly, I think it's a miracle there are any young African Americans in the sport. Uh, for that, uh, yes, I see it. Mm -hmm. And he's asking, 
Uh, given the conditions, what are the reasons you think any uh, young African-Americans would choose baseball? Because it's a phenomenal game. It's still a great game. It's still the best game there is. Um, it's still, from a competition standpoint, it's still, you know, me versus you, batter versus pitcher, and let's go. And I, I think that, um, as I always say, if you put a ball in front of a little kid, they're going to play with it. So don't tell me that black kids don't want to play baseball. You put a ball in front of them, they'll play. They play everything. And, um, and sometimes the game gets inside of you. And, and anybody, I think this is probably the most uh, appropriate comment for this panel, especially when baseball gets inside of you, it gets inside of you for life. And so clearly it makes perfect sense as to why you would want to play this sport. I don't see, I mean, there are lots of reasons why you wouldn't, but there are tons of reasons why you would. Yeah, well put, well put. Uh, while we're waiting for another question to trickle in, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you a question. Uh, who would be your dream biography, including players who are no longer around? Who, uh, who is somebody you would love to really go deep into learning about their life and their story and then telling it? <laughs> Shout out to Tyrone Brooks. I see you out there. Um, I would say, um, obviously, I, yeah, I would love to do a Jackie Robinson book. As much as I've written on Jackie, and as how, no matter how I feel about Jackie, I still would love to find a space somewhere where I felt like I could contribute. I think that would be a lot of fun. And I think the thing in my case, in my case, um, it's not a dream question. It's like, if you feel like there's someone to write about, you go get it. So um, that's, that's a question, Jason, that I will be thinking about for a while after I have decompressed from the Ricky project. Who's next? Yeah, well, right? gosh, which one know, is we, next? We love our numbers here at Sabre. So Emily Hawks wants to know what percentage of uh, Ricky legends would you estimate actually happened? About 90. I mean, that's the funny thing, except the Olerud story. The Olerud story didn't happen. And the Olerud story is so funny because it didn't happen. The fact that, that all of the different people who um, conspired uh, to make that happen now have to apologize to John Olerud all the time because it's the only question he ever gets asked in public. I'm I'm going to uh, I'm going to give you this one from Matt Costello. Most difficult part of writing a biography. Um, access. Um, the most difficult thing about writing a biography is having a point of view, making sure that you have the material to get. You know, I mean, I'll just be very be very quick. My five steps of anxiety in doing a book. Number one, do you have an idea? Sure, I want to write a book about Ricky Henderson. Epi you know, you know, anxiety number two. Step two, can you get it? Ricky didn't want to talk for this book. Well, he did, then he didn't, then he did. So he and I had this dance for the last couple of years about access. Um, that's really the hard part. Can you get the book you want to write? Um, step three, do the work. That's actually the fun part. I love researching. Um, step four, did you pull it off? So that's all the anxiety there about did you actually do a good job? And then obviously step five is, is you know, what's next? What do you want to do next? Um, Ricky will be published in May of 2022. And Dan, if you have a Ricky story, please email me, call me, let's talk. Um, Ricky's Hall of Fame induction speech. Yeah, Ricky, Ricky said from the start after he broke Lou Brock's record and he's on the and, and he's on the field saying today I'm the greatest of all time. He's like, I knew I would regret that for the rest of my life. I was never gonna live that down. So my favorite part, very quickly, I know it's nine o'clock, my favorite part about the Ricky Henderson uh, Hall of Fame speech was that Ricky was convinced that everybody there was going to laugh at him. They thought they were going to get all this third person stuff. They thought that he was going to, he was convinced that they all thought he was going to make an ass out of himself. And so he went to college. He took classes at Laney College, at the junior college, took speech classes to make sure that his moment was not a clown show and that he... He represented himself with, with, with dignity, and it was really fascinating. He was very proud of that. That's outstanding. Well, Howard, we have hit the top of the hour, and uh, I just want to tell you how much I appreciate you and how much Saber appreciates you being part of our 50th anniversary celebration. I will say, representing the baseball card community, that <laughs> there are few players more collected and more beloved than Ricky Henderson. Genuinely, that's what I see out there in terms of players. Uh, from when I was a kid, he's he's like number one or number two. So, uh, 
you were so kind to do this. Your hotel internet somehow outperformed my friend's house internet. <laughs> and I was the one who got bumped. Uh, but thank you so much. Best of luck with the Ricky book. I made sure I pre-ordered the first day you could do it. So I'm sure looking forward thank to it. Thank you, Well, It's my pleasure. And I would just like to close by saying thank you to Sabre because without Sabre, that book doesn't happen. And the other books I've done don't happen because the research is invaluable and the research community is invaluable. And um, I just say, thank you. I mean, this is, it doesn't happen without all of the research and all the materials that are available. Thank you all very much. Well, you're welcome. With that, I'm going to hand things back to Scott Bush, who's got a few announcements, and then we'll make our way into our social hour. Thank you, Howard. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, that was that was really, really terrific, Jason. Thank you so much for, uh, for moderating, moderating both that session, that conversation with Howard Bryant, but also uh, the discussion of 50 Years of Sabre with uh, Anthony Salazar. Donna Muscarella, Emily Hawks, Pete Palmer, Tom Hufford, and Tom Schieber. Uh, Jason mentioned this a little bit. Uh, he's a member of the Chicago chapter. He also touched on his work with the Baseball Cards Committee. I've got here a, uh, an original uh, Kirby Puckett card art that, uh, that Jason sent me last summer. Still hang on to that, Will, for quite a while. So thanks, thanks again, Jason. Um, so as we, uh, as we wrap up this evening, and, uh, and head towards our social hour. I just wanted to bring up a, a few different things. It's, it's been very interesting to me uh, to talk about how the game, uh, the game has changed uh, in that conversation with Howard. Uh, and you know, we know that it's going to continue to change. And similarly uh, for Sabre, uh, Sabre has changed in the last 50 years and, and will also continue to change. And, and one constant for us, other than baseball, of course, uh, has been that the organization has really followed the energy of our members and of the industry. Uh, this is true even now and is reflected in our two newest research committees, the Century Committee, which just launched uh, some really great content on the website last week, uh, and, and the Iconography Project, uh, as well as our support of the recognition of select Negro Leagues as major leagues. Um, as an aside, uh, I do want to mention, I was digging through some old uh, Sabre board meeting minutes uh, looking for something else uh, and discovered that um, the first time a Sabre member petitioned the Sabre board of directors to recognize the Negro Leagues as major leagues was 1983. Um, so there have been members in this organization um, who have publicly made that made that case uh, that far back. And I know several others who've done it before then that we don't have minutes for. Um, the other constant uh, for the organization has been fellowship, uh, which of course has been challenge very challenging uh, since March of 2020. But tonight uh, we, we will be providing breakout rooms um, so that you can spend some time talking baseball with, and, and research, of course, uh, with your fellow members. Uh, so it's the best we can do right now. Uh, I do hope to see everybody in Baltimore uh, at Sabre 50 next August. Very excited uh, to finally put that event together. Um, so here's a toast. I've got, my, uh, I've got my mug, hope some of you do as well. Here's a toast to all of our members for great, first 50 years, uh, and here's to 50 more. Everybody should now be able to turn on their video. Uh, you should be able to unmute yourselves. Uh, and I believe, yes, if you, uh, if you click the little more button on the bottom right, there'll even be uh, the opportunity to join breakout rooms here. So uh, go ahead and, and uh, join a breakout room of your choosing and you'll have the chance to, uh, to chat with your fellow members. Thanks everybody and we'll see you on Friday.